All right, it's SIP episode 96 with winemaker Laura Barrett of Cliff Family Winery. We discuss biodynamic, sustainability, and organic vineyard practices, and they take sustainability to a whole new level. And oh, there's 80 new acres of vineyards. Let's jump right into this. This is going to be an unbelievable episode. We have got an amazing talent this evening. My name is Martin Cody, co-founder of Cellar Angels, your direct-to-consumer source since 2010 of some of the best wines coming out of Napa and Sonoma right now. We connect you to the winemakers, the people behind the projects, and we do it all because we know you don't have the time, uh, but we do. So this is what we do. We actually have a chance to do things that we hope people are proud of. We do it for special reasons, for special people, in the hope that you also tell someone. So please invite them to sip and uh, we can have all fun together. For those of you drinking this week's wine, the climber, we're gonna get into that in a second. We will question this gentleman's sanity, Ron Koch, uh, climbing a rock inverted. Not certain why you wouldn't just take a staircase, but that's fine. Uh, This evening's guest, is Laura Barrett of Cliff Family. And Laura and I were just reminiscing about the first time, and you'll see it on the video in the website for the Cliff feature, where we met in 2014 or 2015 when she first came to Cliff. Uh, I was a bit heavier then, so I think this was in an April shoot right after winter hibernation in Chicago. Uh, It does not look pretty, so purple is not slimming, which is why I'm wearing black this evening. Uh, But for those of you, Seller Angels, direct-to-consumer company, and I mentioned it was 12 years of age, and you can buy this wine right now on the Cellar Angels website. So when you get to the Cellar Angels website, you can always click the logo and you will be immediately brought home. But when you go to shop and you go to the wines, you can see actually the sip kit. And the sip kit used to have Laura's wine. It has since moved on to four more wines. And you can see a special bottle here called BYOB because this is SIP episode 96 this evening, and we are marching toward episode 100. So it's a surprise bottle offer for all of you in episode 100. Tonight, we are gonna be showcasing the climber, and it's a wine that uh, Laura's gonna talk to us about. And without, this is that wine right here, uh, 2019 Bordeaux blend of all five Bordeaux varietals. And before I begin, I do wanna let everybody know that Bill B, I'm sorry, Jim B, Jim B, answered the trivia question correct in roughly a minute and a half since it was posted. So the trivia question was grape skins impart color and blank into a wine. And the correct answer was tannin. There was at least 14 answers and, but Bill B was, or Jim B, sorry, Bill, Jim B was first. So congratulations on that. We're going to get into the climber in a second, but right now I want to get to our featured guest. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me a great, great pleasure to welcome back to the program, Laura Barrett of Cliff Family Winery and talk about everything biodynamic, sustainable, organic, and climber and portfolio. Laura, it's so good to see you. Great to see you. Is this my third interview or is it my second? I can't quite remember. This, I believe, is your third. Okay. It is your second sip, but I also think you did one where it was meet the winemaker because there was a wine club. So, Sounds but, about uh, right. I'm a so pro this, now. <laughs> you are an old pro, but I don't want to say old. You're a seasoned veteran. You Good. are skilled. You've acquired all sorts of experience, knowledge, and wisdom, which is what happens when you've been doing this for a while. And you haven't just done this in Napa. So I would love you to reacquaint people with kind of start with, you can go as far back as, as you want, but I want to know when you had that epiphany to think, hey, you know what? I kind of like wine. This is an interesting, interesting beverage. How old were you? Where did it happen? Yeah, so my story, uh, my wine discovery really came from an academic place. Um, I'm not one of those people that had an epiphany wine. Um, I've certainly had many over the years since I've discovered wine, but uh, my interest in wine really came from academics. Uh, I had been studying chemistry in college and I thought I wanted to go into medicine. Uh, I majored um, in chemistry at the University of Vermont. I got about halfway through and realized I had made a terrible mistake. <laughs> I have, was taking really hard classes, working my tail off. It was so such boring content. I was just, uh, I was distraught. 
Um, but I had come way too far. I had, I had achieved a lot and it was too late to turn back. So I promised myself I would, I would dig deep and find a really interesting application to the science that I was studying that would get me outside. Uh, I had this fear that I was going to work in a pharmaceutical lab in some basement of some, you know, hospital or something deep in the cellar somewhere. Um, so I promised I would find something that was outdoors and interesting. I, I, I became interested in how to make something. I thought, you know, tr the transformation of uh, and, and the science behind how something becomes the product that it is. So I was interested in coffee. And then someone said to me, well, you should be an enologist. And I had no idea what that was at the time. And I started to study up and, um, and dig into fermentation science. And I found the graduate program at UC Davis. So I moved across the country and my sister was living in San Francisco. So it was an easy transition. Uh, and, uh, and also I should mention that after college, I, I played around with this before I dove deep into, into my graduate program. I, I went to New Zealand and I did some traveling, backpacking with some friends, but also landed at a small winery just outside of Auckland and worked my very first harvest in the year 2000. And, uh, and, and then I knew it was a slam dunk that you know, I, I, I had the time of my life. The people were amazing. I loved the work. Uh, it was very happy. So it was a great decision. A couple of different uh, threads I want to pull there. So you made a promise to yourself that you wanted to work outside with the chemistry background? Yes. That's, and so how did I, I like the coffee angle because uh, Bill B, who you know, uh, one of the best sipsters around, uh, also a huge coffee person who introduced Mission Control and I to a coffee plantation on the Big Island of Hawaii, where we now could, because when you, it's a little bit like wine, you get exposed to something really, really good and you don't want to go back. And so we haven't ordered Folgers in two years uh, because, of, <laughs> because of the Kona coffee. But you, you studied in New Zealand and you were just smitten with the process because of the chemistry, the outdoors, the olfactory senses, or all of it? All of it. It was a very well-rounded experience. I mean, I can describe, like I was picking grapes. I wasn't doing anything fancy. I wasn't even into the cellar yet. I was, and we were picking in these little lug boxes, these small little boxes. And we were, it was all the locals and the travelers and we would chit chat and talk to each other. And then you'd pick up your little pail and you'd walk down and you sit, stand next to someone else and start up a new conversation. And they had a little um, mini, an old school mini Cooper that they had ripped out all the seats, but it was small enough that it would drive down the rows of the cool. lines. So we would throw our boxes in there and they'd pile up the grapes and the mini would go screaming down the vine rows and bring the, deliver the grapes to the cellar. So there was just a lot of heart and soul in it that really just got me hooked. Oh, I love it. Uh, Rick, hello. Peter, hello. Juan, hello. Ed, hello. Great to see some new names. Uh, welcome to Cellar Angels SIP episode 96. And you will see some uh, familiar faces. For those of you that are new, they refer to themselves as, sip, as sipsters. They coined the phrase uh, many, many episodes ago, uh, but it has stuck. And so we're, we're appreciative of that. Fellow sipsters know Laura's wine. They had a taste of it in a wine club a few quarters back. So the move from Vermont to California, what year? Well, I graduated in 1999. Um, I took a little bit of time back uh, in my hometown in Massachusetts to kind of gather myself. And, and then I, I was in Australia and New Zealand in 2000. And wow. In my graduate program at UC Davis in 01, and I graduated in 03. So that's pretty quick. I've actually never read really Said that. Yeah, that's fast tracking. <laughs> I, I'm amazed that you just graduated college and, and went off to New Zealand and Australia. I mean, that's fast. Super that was cool. planned. Like I knew I was going to, because I didn't do a semester abroad um, and I knew I wanted to. So the travel was like, was the travel was planned in advance, no doubt. I knew um, I knew I was going to take off for six, six or six to 12 months post college. I'm jealous. All right. So you come, you, you go to Davis, you graduate there, and, and then did you have a job lined up post-graduation in the Valley or anywhere? Yeah, so that's another fun story. Um, <laughs> I have all these stories. Well, I had worked a harvest in the middle of my graduate program at the Napa Wine Company, which is a custom crush facility. It's a huge place, and it was a really nice opportunity to, to network and to meet a bunch of people. Um, so I had 
my foot in the door there and I had made the decision after that harvest that I wanted to work for a female winemaker. So I took a pen and paper back in the day, you know, the olden days, and I wrote a letter to my most well-regarded, well-respected female winemakers, 10 of them, Heidi Barrett, Kathy Corson, Mia Klein, to name a few. Um, and I just then sat back and waited and I got some amazing response. Uh, a lot of it was, well, thank you so much for your letter. It was you know, really touching to connect um, on the topic of female winemakers um, and they maybe didn't have an opportunity, but then Mia Klein gave my letter to Whitney Fisher of Fisher Vineyards and I got hired as an intern from, from that. Um, and then Whitney knew that she was uh, likely going to need somebody full time. So that was an, um, an advantage to taking that harvest job. So right. I ended up working there for five years. Oh, wow. That's pretty cool. The, was there ever any, when you heard the word intern thinking, oh, this is going to be a long road? Did you have any, you know, trepidation? No, I was just dying for an internship. I, you know, I had worked in the lab and all I wanted to do was like get in the cellar. And whenever I talk about you know, women and, you know, everyone always wants to talk about women winemakers and females in the industry. And, um, and that's always my, my greatest, uh, you know, talking point is that it's so hard to get a cellar job and, you know, cause it's so physical and, um, right you know, I was, I was keen. I, I, I just wanted to get my hands dirty and get in there and dig out tanks and schlep hoses and roll barrels. And <laughs> it's so awesome. I miss it. So you don't get to do any of that anymore. Or you just delegate all that. Yeah. I don't do any of that anymore. <laughs> if we owned our own winemaking facility, I would, but we work out of a custom crush facility and the insurance company says I can't touch anything. <laughs> Yeah, no, 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 no. We don't want, this is our marquee player. She's not going to be on the forklift and unloading barrels right. from three stories up. Exactly. What uh, custom crush facility? Um, right now I am making all of the cliff wines at a place called Matera. It's a new okay. facility. Uh, it's, a, it's a brand. Matera makes wine in the Oak Knoll district. Uh, and um, they're about 5,000 cases, a small brand. And they built a winery about six years ago, seven years ago. So it's relatively new um, and it's a great facility, uh, very well designed, very well planned, great equipment and an amazing winemaking and cellar staff. Nice, nothing wrong with that. And it's like three blocks from our new vineyard. So the efficiencies are just, are, are amazing. And we're going to talk about that new vineyard because I think that is truly exciting. But I want to know the jump from Fisher to the, either the next stop or how you ended up at Cliff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had, um, I, so at Fisher, I was the assistant winemaker. So I made a jump to head winemaker in 2008. And I worked for a brand called Casey Flat Ranch. It was a family from Marin that had a 6,000 acre, really like a deer hunting ranch in the KP Valley which is officially Yolo County, but it sat right at 2000 foot elevation at the Napa County border. So it was a bit of an experimental site for this family. They planted a 22 acre vineyard, not knowing exactly how things were gonna work. Um, and I was their first winemaker. Uh, we made a lot of uh, Syrah cab blends. The cab, it was warm there, it's a warm site. The cab didn't necessarily stand on its own. So we started blending it with Syrah and I made some amazing wines up there over the years. So I did that for seven years before I met Lindsay, uh, who's the general manager at Cliff in 2014. Amazing. Seven years. And do you ever go back and taste any of those wines? Oh, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And there, some of them are aging beautifully. Others, you know, it's a little bit of a warmer climate. So the white wines were a drink, drink now type of whites, but the Cab Syrah blends, uh, we called it our, our estate red wine. They're amazing. They're going to last for a long time. That's fascinating because I imagine, I'd be curious of the self-critiquing you might have, similar to like an artist who's a painter, and they go look at some of their er earlier works and just say, oh, wow, I had no idea what I was doing back then. Or do you have, you know, what types of lens do you look through some of your earlier wines on and how do you critique them? You know, that's funny because I think when I'm making wine and I'm blending wine, I'm extremely detailed and, and extremely critical. And you look at every aspect of the blend. Once it's put together and it's bottled, it's really just, in my mind, good or bad. 
<laughs> the, the, the critiquing just gets very, very blunt, very straightforward. Right. Um, so there are vintages where I, I hold on to them and I know that they're delicious and they're, you know, I'll enjoy them for many years to come. And other ones I say, drink it, drink it all, bring it to parties. So it's a <laughs> exactly. That's super exciting. That's gotta be kind of fun to go like take a little trip down a uh, memory lane from a, you know, tasting standpoint. I love it. And the, the custom crush facility out of curiosity, what is the total case production going through there? We'll do about 1000 tons. Um, so, you know, in the custom crush world, that's, that is, I mean, the Napa wine company is probably 9,000 tons. So it's okay. a smaller scale, but Pretty the world size, of custom, yeah. the world of custom crush has opened up quite a bit and, and every little winery that's just trying to fill their space and bring in some cash flow does custom crush. Right. Uh, but the wineries that are actually built and designed for custom crush are a little, a little more uh, few and far between. And this one was designed for custom crush. So we're lucky, but we're, we're an anchor customer there. We we're, we'll do probably 350 tons this coming harvest. So. Well, it's a lot of fruit business. And so when you got to cliff in 2014 or so you inherited a program, were you given the keys to the kingdom to say, hey, Laura, take this where you want to take it? Or what are your guiding principles? What's your philosophy? Here are some guardrails we want you to stay in. What was the methodology to let you do what you wanted to do? Yeah, I, I think they were looking for some growth. Um, and so they really gave me the reins to do that. Um, and I think from like a grape sourcing perspective, I, I led the charge and um, developed those relationships and found the grapes uh, that became the foundation of a lot of these wines. And that was a really critical part of my early influence. Um, as far as wine style goes, I, I definitely think that Cliff family had a style that I was, um, you know, expected and asked to, uh, to stay within the frame of that. They wanted, food is such a huge part of what we do. So they really wanted to make sure that we were making food friendly wines. Um, and most wines are food friendly, but when you get to the white category, like for example, our Chardonnay is a, is a pretty distinctive wine um, that there was a style that they really wanted. They wanted something a little clean and crisp and not a heavy ML butterball Chardonnay. They wanted something right. that was more fruit forward and more acidic that they could pair with wine. With um, but otherwise I had a lot of free reign and, and that's what was so fun because I could come up with ideas and present them and Kit and Gary, our owners are extremely open-minded and, um, and interested in exploration and new ideas and new product. Uh, so they were always willing and open to, to try those things. Yeah, that's very empowering. I, I would imagine from a winemaking standpoint to where you can take those ideas and they're not going to get shot down. They're going to get listened to. They're going to be listened to respectfully and mm -hmm. kind of letting you chart the path forward from a navigation standpoint. Very cool. I do want to uh, welcome Jeff and Jane, who just logged in from Hawaii. Uh, Aloha, which is outstanding. And I also want to launch our first poll question since we were just talking about white wines. The grape pulp is responsible for which of the following? And Laura, you can't answer. Acid, tannin, or color? The grape pulp is responsible for which of the following? Single choice answer, acid, tannin, or color? And then we're gonna talk at the end of this question uh, about the culinary program. I love the story about the, you just sitting down in New Zealand and meeting people. We've said it for 12 years. We said it before that wine brings people together. And that's a perfect example of just meeting people and having a great time doing it. All right, we've got about three more seconds left. Every single item has an answer. So let's just find the answer to this right now. And we have seven folks that have chosen acid one tannin, seven color. So seven are color and tan or color and acid are going to have a cage match. None of the above is two people. The correct answer is actually, you want to blurt it out, Laura? Acid. Acid. Yep. Mm -hmm. The pulp is responsible for acid. The skin on the other hand is the one that's imparts the color and tannin. Um, Actually, you know what? I'm going to go to the next question just for fun. There's only two. 
And this one, since we were just talking about tannin, tannin is a flavor in red wine, true or false? These are actually, truth be told, exam questions on the WSET level two course. So I don't make these up, holy cow. Um, this is how smart these sipsters are. Would you all be amazed if the answer was true? That would, that would, that would stink. Uh, you are all correct. That is impressive. That might be the first time in 95 episodes where every single person got their answer correct. Congratulations, smart wine people. I love it. All right, so culinary program. You just mentioned that food is a very, very big part of everything at Cliff. And I've actually dined at the food truck, which is food truck seems to be a little bit of a misnomer. It's a pretty nice food truck. It's, uh, you know, it rivals some restaurants. But talk to us about that philosophy of from a culinary program and, and why it is so popular. So when Kit and Gary decided they wanted to have a make a wine have a winery, um, their interest and desire really stemmed from their experiences cycling in Europe. And they would go on these long bike rides and they had a friend that owned a bruschetteria in, um, mm. in Italy. And they would they would all get together at the end of the day, you know, exhausted after riding, you know, probably 30, 30 miles on mountain passes, and they would have an amazing meal at their friend's bruschetteria and a beautiful bottle of wine. So that's really where their interest in, in owning a winery came from. Um, so when we started making wine, Gary always wanted to figure out how to get food into our program. And mm. in Napa County, uh, the regulations are, are tight. You know, it's really hard to get a permit um, in the health department and you know, to serve food in your, in your tasting room. So he's you know, an entrepreneur and figures out how to make this happen. So he decided he was going to, instead of trying to battle the permitting process, he was just going to try to get a food truck permit. And we have a commissary kitchen in the back where we do all the prep. And then we really just um, fire, the, fire the food on the truck and serve it. And uh, it's been a screaming success. So um, the goal was not necessarily to have a restaurant, but to have, um, you know, a wine and food experience together. Um, and uh, it's, it's been great. We have now a full-time executive chef. We have six wow. people that work in our culinary program. And that's a combination of staff that uh, work in the prep kitchen and also staff that works on the truck. Uh, and then there's also the, our farm that is a huge piece of it. We have, and that's actually a photograph uh, behind Martin there is that is the Cliff family farm. And what you're looking at um, next to the grapevines is our orchard, and those are apple trees, plum trees, peach trees, and the vegetable gardens are just kind of off in the distance there. Yeah, right there, vegetable gardens. Um, and we bring all, the majority of that to the truck, and our chef works with our farm manager to, uh, to plant and to use um, the things that we grow. And of course, it's certified organic. And then we also have a line of pantry items like sweet and savory jams, homemade hot sauces, nut mixes, chocolates, all sorts of food products that we make. Um, so the, our chef uh, directs the formulas for those and oftentimes we partner with a third party to produce them. Um, so the food piece, so, so for example, in the tasting room, when you come for just a wine tasting, you're gonna get a cheese plate in front of you and it's gonna have little dollops of our sweet and savory jams on top of the Meyer lemon marmalade, um, apple butter, persimmon butter, uh, you know, raspberry preserves, strawberry preserves. Uh, we we make these this amazing, which would sound doesn't sound great, but it's a green pepper jam, and it is so good on a piece of brie. Like it's just it, it's amazing. It does sound amazing. Well, I think so it's, it's super cool that you have. And this is one of the things I think that gets into the sustainability fact that we're going to talk about in a second. It's a good segue to that. But you have the culinary program and recognizing what a, you know, one plus one equals three type of scenario when great food is paired with great wine. And it's not just great food, it's certified organic, you grow it yourself, the chef is overseeing what food items are going to get paired with what wines, what the menu is going to be. And part of that is all 
kind of the philosophy of, of Gary and the five pillars that is important to Cliff family. So educate folks on, as it relates to sustainability, I think, but more importantly, as it relates to, this is just how we conduct our business. What, what are the five pillars? So Cliff Bar was built on what we call the five aspirations. So it's all about sustainability, but it goes much deeper than just, you know, organic farming. And those five pillars are sustaining our brand, sustaining our business, sustaining our people, our planet, and our community. So we adopted that philosophy uh, with Cliff Family Winery. And for example, um, we do something called a sip and support where once a month we have a special menu and we partner with a nonprofit organization that is local and 20% of the proceeds from that day uh, go back to the nonprofit. And that's an example where we support our community. Um, supporting our planet is of course organic farming and sustainable uh, farming and agricultural practices. Um, our people, sustaining our people is something that we all just, that's why we work at Cliff Family Winery. They take such great care of us. They really value our families and our health. Um, and we're, we're very well cared for in many different ways. Um, so it's really about taking sustainability to the next level. And sustainability has become a word um, historically that uh, people have used just to check the box. When, when a, a customer will say, oh, do you farm organically? They say, oh, no, no, but we're sustainable. And it's like, what does that mean? It can mean right. planting some cover crops so that you're preventing erosion, but you're still uh, spraying Roundup at the base of your grapevines. So it became a word that was used very frequently, but really didn't have a lot of meaning. And, and I, I feel that that's really changing. Um, and definitely at Cliff Family, we take a lot of pride in what that word means to us. It's, it's an amazing philosophy and it goes beyond just philosophical because it's put into action. And these five aspirations are lived, breathed, practiced, and I would encourage Sipsters to, to Google some of the five aspirations and how it has manifested in the community and how they have taken care of their employees and things of that nature, because it goes well beyond just paying a very, very competitive and nice wage. It's looking after the families. It's looking after the, the schools that the children attend. I mean, it really, they're involved in every aspect of it. They're just a, a wonderful employer and it, it's, it resonates with with the employees. I mean, they speak very, very highly of it. And Jan, I agree with you. I love the idea of SIP and support. Uh, anything that has the word SIP in it, I'm a little biased there because of the program, but a SIP and support is a, is a good thing. The, the overall production that you have, Laura, what, what is overall case production? And then kind of guide us through or walk us through the portfolio. Yeah, so when I came on board in 2014, I bottled 4,000 cases um, for the Calendar year 2023, I am projected to bottle 15,000 cases. <laughs> so we've had quite a bit of growth. Um, with our new vineyard, we are, we're, our goal is to be in that 12 to 15,000 case range. Um, I'm sure that will increase uh, as we get more experience, but we are a mainly uh, you know, direct to consumer business. Um, we sell so much of our wine out of the tasting room and our wine club. Um, so that's actually, it's a pretty large number for not having national distribution. You know, we don't sell wine in New York or Florida or. <laughs> but do you, do you look back in that and think, you know, that wasn't that long ago. That was six years or so ago. Right. And you, and you're at 4,000 cases. And is it nail biting when you hear 15,000, you think, oh my goodness, what are we doing? Or is it crazy? Is it comfortable? No, I mean, for me, it's really comfortable because we, we sell out of these wines every year and there's never a time. I mean, I'm sure we'll get there this year with, with such a big jump, but there's never a time when we're, 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 you know, we have too much inventory and we say, okay, we've got to do something to move this wine. It's always staff coming to me saying we need more wine. <laughs> so I feel really confident. always, always. That's impressive. So you haven't met a new wine project at the winery that you haven't endorsed, right? Never, not, not yet, not yet. <laughs> so talk about the portfolio, what it was then and what it is now, and maybe uh, some future aspirations. Sure. So we have always been a winery that has many, many different 
varietals. That's always been the case. Um, I haven't really brought on any new varietals. Um, we make uh, Sauvign a couple Sauvignon Blancs. We make a couple Rosés, Viognier, Chardonnay, Gewürztraminer. Uh, on the red blends, we make a Bordeaux blend, which is the climber. We make a Rhone blend, uh, several different single vineyard Cabernets. I make a Petite Syrah, Zinf two Zinfandels, Petite Syrah dessert wine, a sparkling wine. We do it all <laughs> um, to the point where when they, if anybody says we should make an Albarino, I say, are you kidding me? Like, <laughs> I would love You're to- like, are you kidding me? Who's planting an Albarino that I didn't know about? Oh my, yeah, exactly. So, of course, my ultimate goal is to do it all and to do it all really well. I want every wine that that our customers taste to be delicious, a delicious example of the bridal that they're tasting. Um, and let me let me back up a second. Did I hear the word sparkling? You did. Yes, you did. Uh, have you been holding out on us? <laughs> So the sparkling wine program has come in and out of our portfolio over the years. And um, it's something that, you know, we don't have the equipment to make sparkling, right. wine. The sparkling wine production takes a lot of, uh, you know, different style bottling lines and, and equipment. Um, so we partner with a, a very reputable local sparkling wine producer that uh, can't say the name, but um, you would be pleased. And we work with them uh, to make our own sparkling wine. So I get to choose the base wine and, um, and kind of see it along. And then uh, we do dosage trials and they bottle it for us with our label and our choice of foil. Uh, and it's, it's a great product. I love it. Yeah. Dosage trials sounds like torture. <laughs> it's, it's one of the worst days of the year. Yeah, I bet it is. <laughs> I bet it is. Uh, before we get to Google Earth, I see so many smiling faces, and I know some folks would like to ask a question, William. Uh, so I would like to know, Bill, if you would like to ask Laura a question. Yes. First of all, Laura, a huge shout out to Scott Vizza. He is an absolute rock star, and he just is processing an order for some, some bottles of the unoaked shard for me as we're on this sip, so... Awesome. Love it. Um, I have a particular interest in ESG and sustainability as a board member. And I had two questions for you. Given the profile that you guys would have with influential people, have you signed on to or thought about signing on to the UN Sustainability Development Goals to earn some of the, uh, the medallions and to really sort of bring into sadly a country that really doesn't embrace sustainability the way it should and the second question i have is are you aware of the porto protocols that are coming out of the wine industry in europe and hopefully getting to north america and south america which is an initiative begun in portugal by some of the big port houses but is very much to help with the obvious terrible effects of climate change, which in our the vineyard that I'm involved with uh, in Sonoma is really starting to devastate our, our ability to grow Pinot on site. Yeah, so I am not familiar with the Porto Protocol. Um, I do know, just to kind of go back to your first question, we, um, we are not involved in that certification process, but we are very, very close. Well, we're doing, we're involved in two new certifications. One is Napa Green, and Napa Green has, is a local uh, certification, uh, and it is run by the Napa Valley Vintners Association, and their goal is to get all of their members uh, cert, sort of Napa Green certified. Um, and it comes with a winery certification and a vineyard certification. So obviously we're just doing the winery piece. Um, and um, it's a new, it, it's been around for, that name has been around for several years, but it's a, a new certification process that is diving very deep into the business piece. Um, so it's asking questions like, um, you know, are you, how are you taking care of your employees? Are you doing DEI training and, uh, you know, safety training? And so it's, it's going deeper into the business piece. Um, 
And not some people are criticizing Napa Green because it doesn't require organic. You can still use Roundup and be Napa Green certified, which some people have a hard time with. Um, but they just know that they can't get everybody compliant, um, or they wouldn't be able to get 100% compliance if they were to add that in. So of course we have Napa Green, we have CCOF, and we're doing B Corp certification, which is is our our business as a whole. And that's going to be, um, that's going to be a big project that Lindsay's working on right now. And we're, uh, we're digging deep into that. We have a consultant working with us to, to gather all the information. It's like all of the, all of the processes and the, the work is there. We're doing it all. It's just a matter of getting it on paper and communicating it to, to our people. And we've done, we've made a huge effort over the last three years to do a better job. Like I encourage you all to look at the sustainability page on our website um, we've done a lot of work on there and there's a lot of great information, um, but gathering that information and getting it onto a certification and, and communicating to the world that we're doing all these great things is actually harder than doing them. <laughs> oh, it's, it's ridiculously challenging. You can be doing everything for the B Corp and it takes a long time to submit all of the filing, all of the paperwork, all of the testing, all of the validation. And that's just the B Corp, let alone the CCOF and the Napa Green. Yeah. Yeah. Good, good um, questions, Bill. An oak shard too, because that's a new product. I'm glad you're going to get some. It's delicious. You'll love it. That's for Sheila. <laughs> <laughs> I thought Bill might've been turning over a new leaf with the white <laughs> wine, but I, I see it's for Sheila. I like it. Awesome. I do want to let people know where you are, but before I do that, the last time we spoke, you were uber excited because you were, were buying a new wine or a new vineyard. And you had brought on a new vineyard. And it's funny, when we go to Google Earth, many of the Sipsters are very, very familiar with Stagecoach. And I'm going to show a snapshot of Stagecoach. But it was really kind of the, the acquisition of Stagecoach that got you thinking. And, and I would like you to tell the story, Laura, because it, coming from a winemaker in Napa Valley, it's a story that is very powerful. We've shared it with uh, Sipsters before in our audience to say this just happened and now there's 85 to 90 plus wineries that are in a world of hurt. So pick it up from there. Yeah, so kind of um, following up on our my story about the five aspirations, um, you know, in whatever year, did we decide it was 2016 that Stagecoach sold to Gallo? And yes. what happened, I went to Lindsay and I said, you know, if, if you're going to, if we're really going to talk about sustaining our business, we must buy a vineyard. Um, we at the time only had 10 acres of vineyard, a state vineyard, and it was all on Howe Mountain. And now that was a huge part of what we were doing. Our Howe Mountain cab program is, is, a, is a pillar to our, our portfolio. Um, but I was buying so many grapes and I was, you know, all of a sudden I couldn't get Viognier and then, I'll, then we weren't making Viognier anymore. And it was just this, this moment in time where I said, we, we, we must buy a vineyard. And, and she said, well, what do you want? And I said, well, okay, I want 40 acres in Oak Knoll. <laughs> well, it's, since it's you asked, I would like 40 acres in Oak Knoll. Um, <laughs> the Rodeo Drive of Vineyard Space, yes. Yeah, so um, they, they, they started looking and six months later, by golly, we found 40 acres of, oak, you know, of vineyard in Oak Knoll. And not only was it 40 acres, but it was 40 acres of dirt, which is like so impossible to find. You pay hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars per acre for Cabernet vines already planted. That's not what we wanted. We needed to feed our diverse portfolio and we need Sauvignon Blanc and Viognier and Chardonnay and Merlot. And, you know, I don't need 40 acres of Cab. Right. It was like, so such a, such a huge opportunity. And Oak Knoll is interesting, and we'll show a little bit of a map uh, of Oak Knoll in right now, as a matter of fact, uh, to give you an idea of what it looks like. It's, I mean, here's Oak Knoll, obviously right here. It's the mouth of Napa Valley. The city of Napa is, is right here, and we'll show it on Google Earth in a second. It's a very, very large AVA. It has 8,300 acres in Oak Knoll alone. 4,200 or so are under vine and half of that, about 1,600 acres of the 42 are cab. So to your point, Laura, it's like, yeah, I don't need 40 acres of Cabernet. I, I want to, if I want to plant that, I can. But uh, OKD 
as it's referred to, is just right outside of Napa. You've all driven by it if you've been to the valley or driven through it. If you've looked on the right-hand side of Route 29, you've seen Trefethen. They're part of Oak Knoll. Uh, there's several wineries that are layered as part of Oak Knoll. O'Brien is part of Oak Knoll. And then they all have physical structures inside the AVA. There's a bunch of wineries that source fruit from there or have a vineyard block like Laura does now where they own land that actually don't have a physical structure. Uh, Cliff doesn't have a physical structure that you can visit in Oak Knoll. Blackbird does not. So there's others there that have been sourcing some amazing fruit there that maybe own vineyard land there. But it started out at 40 acres and now it's gotten a little bigger. How did how did that happen? Did they make the mistake again of saying, what else do you want? <laughs> that that was it. That was it. <laughs> that six months later, the neighboring 40, 40 acre parcel, which had been up for sale right before ours was and planted quickly organically, thank, thank goodness. Um, and and that, that buyer, the, the person that owned that parcel, purchased a large winery in Pritchard Hill and then decided to offload this investment. So it came up for sale. And so we bought that too. So now we have 80 acres of wow. new, newly planted vines in the Oak Knoll district. And I have 10 different varietals planted. I have Sauvignon Blanc, Viognier Chardonnay. I have the five Bordeaux varietals, Cab, Cab Franc, Merlot, uh, Malbec, Petit, oh, I have Petit Syrah and Zinfandel. So the only thing that I'm missing from my wine portfolio, my wine making portfolio, is Grenache and Syrah and Gewurztraminer. There probably is uh, a vineyard for sale. <laughs> In Mendocino County, where I need all that to come from. <laughs> exactly. Well, so now, and none of the fruit from these 80 acres is has come online yet, has it? Well, um, I my or first maybe, was 2021. Yeah. So okay. I harvested all of the grapes from there. And of course, it wasn't a lot of fruit. Each Some of the blocks produced nothing, or they produced fruit, but we made the decision to, to drop it. And some of them produced a half a ton per acre, and then maybe some of them produced one and a half tons per acre. So it was low yields, uh, which is totally normal and typical what we would expect from young vines. Mm -hmm. um, it all those, I made all those lots, and um, it's been awesome to taste. I have bottled uh, three, three of them, or four of them. I bottled a rosé of Cab Franc, I bottled the unoaked Chardonnay. Uh, I bottled the Oak Knoll District Sauvignon Blanc and Viognier. Oh wow! So all uh, either released or in line for kind of a fall fall release. And then I am working. In fact, I was working um, today for quite some time on blending the twenty one reds. I have many many lots of Cab and all the blending varietals. Um, it's going to be a lot of fun, and I'm going to make a lot of wine in twenty one from this property. Well, I now know how you're going to go from, you know, 11,000 to 12,000 to 13,000 to 15,000 right. ca cases and, and beyond. the Climber is one of those wines that I will be making from this new property. Well, we talked a little bit about sustainable and, and what it means, not only from too often it's a checkbox on a list of requirements. And like you said, people are still using Roundup. We've also talked about it from the five aspirations. One of the other things that people are hearing a lot about, and it seems to be growing in popularity, is biodynamic. So I'm curious, given now how well you know the fruit sources and how well you're going to know uh, the new 80 acres, how does this type of farming, biodynamic, organic, or sustainable, how does it translate and manifest into the bottle that the consumer will be enjoying? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I like to describe it. I mean, well, putting the word organic on your label is really hard to do. So these, although we're farming organically, we're not technically making organic wine. So our wine is not certified organic, but our grape and grape source, our vineyards are. Um, making organic wine becomes very challenging because there are a lot of TTB regulations uh, that um, take away a lot of my opportunities to make the wine delicious, <laughs> put it that way. Um, so um, 
we can't really, we, and, and we're lucky that we hand sell a lot of this, this wine and, and I can be, be consumer facing and talk to you and tell you all about how we're farming organically. So we can spread the word, but we can't necessarily put it on our label. Um, I like to talk about the value in, or the, the taste and the flavor in like, if you have a, um, like if you go to the grocery store and buy raspberries, it's my usually my go-to example, like the organic raspberries taste a lot better than the conventional raspberries. They're riper, they're more flavorful. They might not last as long on the shelf because the pesticides and the, you know, all the sprays and such are not there. Um, but they definitely taste better. And it's just much more, you know, we all buy them because we know they're better for us, right? We know we're not poisoning ourselves with pesticides and herbicides and horrible things that we put into the ground. Um, so in the final product, I think, you know, we, we don't have an experiment where we have a control and we can say, oh, taste this, it tastes better than the conventionally farmed, which is why a lot of farmers can't wrap their head around, you know, converting from conventional farming to organic farming, because it's not necessarily measurable in a controlled experiment where you're, you're, you're comparing flavor, um, uh, you know, the flavor of the wine. Um, but I think we know we have healthier soil. Um, we know we have more biodiversity. We have cover crops, we have bees and we have healthy pests and um, we have good healthy growth, which is putting nitrogen into the soil. So we know these things from a farming perspective. Right. Uh, and really, it's it's about um, it's more about for me the the heart and soul of the process of organic farming, where I just I feel better about what I'm doing um, because of how it's impacting my life and our farm workers, and um, and I do believe that the fruit tastes better. But like I said, I don't I, we don't really have a controlled situation where I can show you prove that to you, but well, we, feel it, we feel it in our. In our bones. A, a couple, a couple things I want to expand on, and you're right. It's almost, you know, when you go to the farmer's market, you're buying it direct from the farmer who has been farming it without pesticides and, but hasn't paid the investment of what it's going to be required to actually put organic on the raspberries, organic on the strawberries. You, you notice a difference in the color. You notice a difference in the taste. Uh, eggs are the same way. When you get free range eggs, it's a completely different uh, body weight in the mouth. The, uh, the color is an intense orange versus this bright synthetic yellow. I mean, it, you see it time and time again. I'm interested when you get the CCOF uh, certification for the grapes, how is it that you can use organic grapes and not, can't call the wine organic? Yeah, so in order to, to certify your wine organic, the facility has to be certified organic. So you have to go through this process um, with CCOF to make sure that you're, they have certain criteria to certify the facility. And there are restrictions on what you can use in your wine. So right. I might not be able to use a certain kind of enzyme. I have my sulfur, which is my preservative in the wine is restricted. I'm only allowed, I think 80 part per million total um, uh, sulfur free SO2 or total. And uh, that's where it becomes really difficult as a winemaker because I, you know, I need this wine to uh, be stable in the barrel for 22 months, um, a red wine, and that's a long time. And there is bacteria and spoilage organisms that I have to battle. Um, so a lot of times these wines that are organic um, and, and natural wine has become a buzzword where those people are making wine organically maybe not certified, but they use this term natural, they can right. be spoiled, they can be cloudy, they can be faulty. Um, and it's because we can't use the tools that we have in order to preserve the wine the way that we have learned to do so. So either the, the TTB needs to lighten up on some of those parameters, um, or we need some new product to help us um, preserve the wine uh, and prevent spoilage and, and that, that fall under the CCOF um, certified. But in the meantime, we're trying to make some changes where we can put the word organic and there's one, there's one way around it. You can make an ingredient statement on your label and we are working on this. Um, we hope to do it uh, next year uh, where you make an ingredient statement and the first ingredient is organic grapes. That's where we're headed. I like it. Very smart. It allows Very us smart. to get it on the bottle. 
Um, but it doesn't mean that we're certified organic wine product. The um, Karen has a couple ideas about you buying carbon offsets. So uh, I see a side mm -hmm. transaction here, which is fine. Mm -hmm. uh, yep. And the you do have to probably create a new certification. Uh, I also think it's funny, Laura, that you know, you can go probably as far back or as recently as 15 years or so ago or 20 years ago at the max. And if your product was labeled organic, it was on the lower shelf of any store in the health food aisle and no one even looked at it. And, and so now it's it's the buzzword of the century with regards to food and wine. Uh, so it's, it's come full circle. I like what you're doing as it relates to creating a, a new label, which is a standpoint of, okay, this is one way to, to combat it. TTB probably does need to, to address a few things. Uh, but before someone tears my head off and we need to get to Google Earth and, and show some things uh, because this is what it's all about, showing people, show and tell. Uh, we've been talking about the new winery or the new vineyard and uh, Jeff has had a Mai Tai, so he's screaming Google Earth. Uh, so for us, for those of you that are new, as I mentioned at the onset, we're a direct-to-consumer company. Uh, we have been doing this for, since 2010, featuring solely wines from Napa and Sonoma that, as Laura said, you just can't get because the wines aren't in distribution, but they're from amazing producers like Laura. And so this is our playground, is the wine region of, of Napa and Sonoma. And here you have a little bit of Napa and a little bit of Sonoma. Now I talk about this and, and Laura can appreciate this uh, because she lives it every day. This is an extremely unique region. First, it has a Mediterranean climate. 3% of the world is Mediterranean climate and, and Napa and Sonoma County are in fact classified as a Mediterranean climate. What we also get into is the dirt. And, and the dirt is pretty spectacular because there's over 400 different series of dirt on the globe and almost half of them reside in these two counties. And so there's also 33 different soil types and great, I think it's 14 different soil types reside in Napa and Sonoma. So when you talk about a, a blank canvas to produce wines, you're looking at some of the richest mineral earth on the globe. And we talked about Stagecoach being kind of a catalyst as it relates to when Stagecoach got sold, this is the Stagecoach Vineyard and, and 92, 93, Laura can check my math, small wineries that were sourcing fruit from there were essentially out of business because Gallo had purchased it for 220 some odd million dollars. They were, they were letting the contracts expire. And once the contracts expired, they were not renewing them. So those, those winemakers, the Chad Angelos and the many other wineries that several of you have, have been exposed to on Cellar Angels were, were gone. Uh, then the pandemic hit, then there's been some changes, but I think it was a great thing for you, Laura, from a business perspective to say, hey, uh, Gary, we need to solve this problem because this could happen to us if our vineyard sources go, we have to own something. So you put out a wish list, Santa came early and the, the new vineyard is pretty spectacular. Because it is, if you look, when I showed you guys that map earlier about Oak Knoll. So here you have Oak Knoll. And it is at the mouth of Napa. This is kind of the widest area of Napa Valley right in here. It's about five miles wide from mountain range to mountain range at its widest point. Napa as a valley is 30 miles long as its longest point. But Oak Knoll, the OKD district, is where this new vineyard is. And I will click on that. And then we'll zoom in a little bit closer because it's right off of Route 29. And this should look familiar. Bistro Don Giovanni is right here. If anybody wants to go to eat, I highly recommend it. It's uh, delicious. Uh, so this whole square or what part of this is all yours? So the whole Southern half is ours. So that, that square was 160 acres owned by the Jaeger family. The Northwest Quadrant is now um, uh, owned by Laird. The okay. East Quadrant is Camus, and we own the entire Southern half. And that reservoir in the middle is, uh, is shared by all four parcels and actually um, is one of the few reservoirs in the area that has this very valuable straw that sucks 
water from the Napa River when we're allowed to. There are strict parameters, but we can fill that reservoir when the river reaches a certain height during a certain time of year. Um, so that is extremely valuable. That That is a valuable straw. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And we've worked really hard since over the last four years uh, to um, to re redo that reservoir. We have all new pumps and um, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a critical piece of the property. We also dug a well in the very Southeast corner, um, that is very powerful and will provide us with, uh, additional water source. So are each, and this picture was taken, uh, October 22nd, 2020 from the Seller Angel satellite, okay. uh, is, is this, are these blocks all different varietals? Yeah, so um, the entire western quadrant was that second 40 acres that I um, that I alluded to, or the, sorry, I should say the southwestern quadrant. <coughs> Excuse me. So that's all red. That is mostly cab, a little bit of PV, a little bit of petite Syrah, and some cab franc and Merlot. Um, and the southeastern parcel is basically broken up into what you see as like six blocks. Yep. Um, one that's closest to the neighborhood, that's all the whites, the Sauvignon Blanc, Chardonnay, and Viognier is all down there. And then the reds are to the north. And that was all based off of, we dug about 12 to 15 soil pits on those 40 acres. And um, we had a consultant that designed the vineyard for us and determined, you know, made a recommendation on which varietals should go where in the road direction and the trellising and the pruning style and all of that. So that was very, very tailored um, and specific to our winery goals and needs. Is this the well? Uh, that is the one of the wells, yes. Wow. So, yeah. That's impressive. Now let's yeah. take folks to the tasting room way up Valley. Just on the outskirts of the town of St. Helena or actually in St. Helena and this is fantastic because it is, you said, expanding. Uh, the food truck, I think, is right here. Correct. Visible. I don't know when we sent the satellite over, but I'm glad they got a picture of this. Um, and so you can get something from the food truck. This is a covered outdoor tasting area. So, and I mean covered, not like a roof enclosure, but covered with some heavy netting. And so you're still out outdoors, but this is Route 29 right here going into St. Helena, and you've all probably driven past this tasting room and not even known it was there. And now you can just go to the food truck, get an expertly prepared uh, small bite plate of a variety of different foods, grab some wine and just sit out here to your heart's content. And then when they throw you out, you can walk across the street to Farmstead uh, and, and, and enjoy some of the best food as well. So you've got good neighbors. We do, we do. So now what the, the news at this Cliff family compound is at the very back of the, the property at the very end of Vitovich Lane, there you go. We have renovated even further back all the way to the to the Dr. Crane Vineyard, the, that building. You see, it looks like it's under construction there. That building is finished. Um, it is about 50% a new office space for our staff. And the centerpiece is a be beautiful boardroom. And, um, and then the other side is a beautiful new tasting room that will not, nothing up front changes. This is an additional tasting room where it's more of a one-on-one -on -one experience. And what is super cool is that not only do you get your own um, wine educator, but you get your own culinary rep as well. So we have someone from the kitchen that comes in and presents each pairing and describes the food while our wine educator describes the wine and you have two two cliff family staff members to the group it's really a top-notch experience and the food you leave as if you've had a meal um, we also do lunch but the the food and wine pairing is just phenomenal no that sounds scary insanely good and it is and is quite new so congratulations on that i can see the giddiness of excitement in your eyes that is super cool uh one thing i do want to let folks know this is the cliff 
family climber that is currently on the website right now. And oh, by the way, there's an angel bonus offer where if you purchase a case of this, you get to have a complimentary tasting of four and maybe there'll be a culinary rep at your table. But I would be remiss in the closing minutes, Laura, if we didn't do kind of flavors aroma profile of the climber. You bet. So I, I'm going to top up my glass here because I've been drinking as we've been talking. <laughs> Hopefully you have. Occupation, um, occupational hazard. So I make this wine. Um, you know, this is this is something that I want you to be able to enjoy right away. Uh, I don't want this to require five years of cellar aging. So it's made specifically and blended specifically to be approachable at a young age. It should taste good and smell good right away. Um, we bottle it under a screw cap and that is our marketing message to tell you to drink it. Right. Um, yeah, so this particular vintage is 77% Cabernet, 11% Petit Verdot, which is a heavy dose of Petit Verdot. That's where you're getting a lot of that great color and great weight and tannin on the mid palate. That's coming from the Petit Verdot. Most Petit, um, you know, the, the, the blending percentages are usually a lot lower than that on the one to four percentile range. Uh, we have 6% Merlot, 5% Malbec, 1% Cab Franc. Not a huge amount of new oak on this wine, so you're not going to get a, a, a lot of toasty oak. Um, it's a lot of fruit. So I love, um, for me, descriptors, a lot of uh, black olive, some dried herbs. To me, this wine is very savory, like a savory spice to it. Um, I find it to be extremely well balanced. And I tend to talk about wine in how it feels on my palate. I'm not a winemaker that is usually you know, giving you, a, you know, 50 descriptor words, I tend to talk about more of the sensation on, on my palate. So I love how well balanced this is um, from start to finish from the entry all the way till after you've swallowed your sip of wine and you still feel that texture on your tongue. Um, it has really great balance. Um, the tannins are medium to, I would say medium weight, but it has enough acid to balance that. Um, very focused uh, in a really nice long finish. So you're tasting that wine for um, you know se several seconds after you you've had your sip. That is a, a fantastic assessment of the tasting aspect of it. I love the screw cap as the immediate marketing message. Hey, don't age this. Uh, go ahead and open this right now and enjoy it. What would you pair with this? Um, you know, this I would consider, although, I mean, it has some substantial tannin, so this could hold up, I, I think this is a great barbecue wine, um, you know, we're headed into summer season here, I think this would go great with, um, like a robust hamburger with a lot of fixings, a lot of blue cheese and caramelized onions and sauteed mushrooms, um, it could also be something that, that you could do on a, with a lighter meat, um, I think it definitely needs a little bit of fat. It needs a little bit of cheese or something uh, to balance out because there's some there's some pretty rich tan in there. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, there's I, mean, I this like it. Diverse wine that you could pair with a lot of different. Any, things. you know, you you said fat. Would you any ice creams you would pair with this? I'm asking for a certain uh, just oh. curious, like maybe pistachio, Rocky Road, Jim Beam. I got you covered. Salt. Caramel. Oh, with caramel with sea salt. Bingo. Nails it. Uh, just walk in to Cold Stone Creamery, ask them about their corkage fee and sit back with, there you go. I like it. Very good. Laura, you have been outstanding. I think, uh, Peter, I know there was a couple of questions we did not get to of yours. We'll share those with Laura and she can email you privately. So Definitely. that will be uh, good. I like the question about cork and I like the question about warming climates and varietal selection. So we'll, we'll get that answered offline. The thing that we need to recognize and tell everybody about SIP episode 100 is indeed coming up. So please send us your pictures of your wine cellars. A couple have come in already. And oddly enough, they did not come in with invitations to visit in person because some of these cellars are pretty extraordinary. So I like what SIPsters are doing as it relates to their collections of wine. Next week, George Noble. Mr. Noble is going to grace us with his presence. If you have not had George's wines, uh, he is a marvel of the industry. Uh, just some amazing food sources. I think George is in his late seventies now. He might hurt me for saying that, uh, but sources some incredible wines off of Pritchard Hill and some very nice places. And he has one of those philosophies where he wants to age the wine for six to eight years 
So you don't have to. So his current release, I think, is a 2014. Uh, but the questions that we want to have coming uh, from all of you for George, it'll be a lot of fun. I can't thank you enough, Sipsters, for your participation each week to help us make a difference for wineries like Cliff Family. Because every single time you decide to buy from the marketplace, join the wine club, or do both, you basically are sending the message that you want to make a difference and, and essentially kindness matters and kindness of Laura to spend her evening on Friday with us. Uh, we cannot say thank you enough. It is so good to see you again, Laura. So cheers to you. Cheers. Thank you so much. This is always so fun. I love this. Let's thank you. Again. Everyone stay safe. Be good to one another and bring friends next week. We're moving towards 100. Have a great week and all. Cheers. Cheers.